Well, thank you, Mike, and thank you, Peter. Um, they were excellent and thought-provoking overviews. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's your opportunity now to ask questions um, of our speakers, um, and the process is if you can raise your hand, a microphone will come to you. If you can then state your name and the organisation you're from and ask your question. Thank you. Whilst you're thinking about it, uh, our um, online audience does have a question, and it's to Mike. Mike, with the introduction of uh, more and more capital from international investors, especially in China, mm. uh, will our real estate and infrastructure uh, market prices become overheated? Um, or is, I think your point uh, that you made was there is a desperate need for capital uh, uh, in Australia, is that a more important consideration? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would say that the actual um, capital gap is still very significant. Australia still balances the country's books by um, inward in investment. You know, that is still a very important um, dynamic and has been so for, um, you know, for, for 150 years. Um, so it is important that we do attract inward investment. The fact that it used to come from uh, the US, uh, Europe, uh, the UK, uh, New Zealand to an extent, um, really was just a reflection on, on those trade patterns and indeed you know, trade investment normally follows trade. So it is quite um, understandable that now the pool of capital will be China, Japan, Korea, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, etc. So it, I don't think it's something we should be worried about. Hmm. Good, thank you. Well, unless, we d unless it doesn't come. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Stephen in the front here. Uh, Stephen Martin from Cedar to, to Mike Smith. Mike, uh, you mentioned uh, very much in your, in your talk the fact that uh, the Asian century provides opportunities for us and you listed a number of, of opportunities that do exist. I would like your thoughts around Australian services mm. and the ability for Australian businesses to engage much more widely than they currently do in terms of that, uh, that Asian market that's there and perhaps using your bank's uh, experience as one of Australia's leading exporters of uh, financial services into mm. the Asian region. Yeah, look, I think the opportunity is huge, and, and it's it's not only services in you know financial services and the remit you know the the whole um, uh, or mass of, of opportunities that um, that provides for accounting companies, um, you know, actuarial companies, property companies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but it's in specialised services as well. For example, in in terms of um, mining services, in terms of agricultural R and D. Um, and indeed agricultural services and you know in, it, in its broader terms um, and also um, services in terms of establishing higher higher value uh, manufacturing you know I saw a very interesting company the other day in in, uh, in, West, in West Victoria which was making um, gearboxes for Formula One um, and and V8 supercars you know this is a very highly um, highly technical, um, very, very high value-added um, business. But that's the sort of thing that can't be done in Asia but at presently, um, but it's the sort of thing that we can, we can continue to um, be uh, globally competitive in. And that's the sort of thing that needs to be, you know, to be thought through. But I think the whole service industry um, growth is something that Australia does well. Tourism is another one, you know, tourism services. And, uh, and these are things that we've really got to, to build out. Health is another um, classic, uh, classic one which we can do really well. So there is the, the opportunity, how to, how to make that happen um, is just uh, a question of, of getting on with it. Now, there, there does need to be, I think, an improvement in, in our tax system. Uh, the tax system is, is Byzantine. Um, it's, it's been established for um, last century's economic models. You know, the fact that we're looking here at, at um, creating jobs and, and growth 
and we have something called payroll tax, you know. So we, you pay more tax everybody you employ. You know, what sort of logic does that have? You know, it, it's, a, it's a crazy system. So I think we have to um, fundamentally look at how we can encourage business through tax breaks, and we must do more to encourage the entrepreneurs. You know, we, we, are, we are basically creating bureaucracy that stifles entrepreneurism. And the only reason we get entrepreneurs now is, is through immigration. And we should be doing more uh, to do that. But we've got to change the tax system to actually encourage it. The R&D that comes out of medical, out of, out of agriculture, is world class. But most of it is commercialized in the United States because of tax breaks. That just doesn't make sense. Thank you, Mike. Um, I have a further question from online, and I, um, the question is directed to either Peter or Mike. I think, Mike, you might struggle with the first half of this question, but is there room for further reductions in interest rates in Australia? Uh, and what are your predictions for the housing cycle? I think Mike's perfectly uh, qualified <laughs> to answer this. <laughs> Definitely qualified. Oh, OK. <laughs> So I was taking a break there. <laughs> Look, I mean, interest rates, I mean, it, 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 who can say? I mean, I think the, the uh, decision by the Reserve Bank um, this week and, and indeed the commentary that, that came from it uh, looks like that the interest rate cycle um, is likely to, be, uh, to remain where it is right now. Um, and I don't think that's a particular um, a surprise. Um, housing, you know, I, I, I think that ha there has been an adjustment in, in residential housing in Australia. That there is, um, you know, I, I think it's more sustainable now than it was in 2007. I think the, um, the earnings ratio to, uh, or average earnings to uh, average uh, price of, of housing uh, is, is got much better. Um, and it is better than places like Hong Kong or, or, um, or Singapore or central London or Manhattan. Um, but really, uh, the issue there is, um, is a question of, of supply and demand. And, and, and uh, you know, you'd, you'd still say that there is insufficient supply of housing still uh, to cope with demand. And therefore, that's going to, to uh, keep an element of, of uh, you know, price stability or certainly uh, will uh, keep, uh, underpin um, the, uh, uh, the price. Do I think it's going, getting overheated? No, I don't. Um, certainly, um, it's moving you know, slowly, but, but I don't think it's overheated. Brad, can I just make the point about interest rates? I think there's a political trap here, and the, with interest rates said to be at historic lows, there's only one way they can go, and that's up. And uh, come the next election, I think uh, I'll make the prediction that uh, the interest rates will be an issue, and the point will be made that uh, when, the, when the, there was the change of government in September 2013, interest rates were 2.5, whatever the rate was, and now they're 5.5, whatever. So th that'll become an election issue, but uh, I'd point out that it's a political trap. Thank you. Um, I might just exercise the chairman's prerogative and ask one final question, then I'm getting the, like this, which means cut it off. So my question is to Mike. Um, Mike, I note a certain tension between uh, your point that uh, we've had a decade of lost reform and the fact that the current government has set the expectation that we should not look forward to radical reform in their mm. current term. Um, that sounds like 13 to 14 years of lost reform opportunity. You also made the point that uh, a considered approach by government is better than improvisation. Mm. Um, we can only hope that the engagement with the the better engagement with government, that you, uh, with business you've mentioned, and right. the involvement of the Productivity Commission uh, on a number of issues will result in some um, sound policy development. Uh, what are the prospects of uh, the government having the capacity to sell such an agenda and actually advocate an agenda in the lead up to the next election, so election which mm. populist politics suggest you don't, uh, you don't move forward with bold reform? Look, I think one of the issues is that um, we lack a vision. We lack a vision for Australia. I mean, if I was if I was um, Tony Abbott or even you know or Bill Shorten right now, the one thing that I would do is try and create 
a, uh, a bipartisan vision of what Australia should look like in 2050. You know, what do we really want to become? Because unless we have that um, idea, you know, that light on the hill, it's hard to determine what policy, you know, what, what economic framework we need around it. So what's happening at the moment is that we're having reviews and, and inquiries and, and various things about various parts of the economy without knowing what we're trying to get to. And, you know, I would, I would stand back a little bit and say, look, this is what we really do need to do. Get consensus on that. You know, much like um, uh, Hawke, Keating, um, Bill Kelty, you know, the, the way that they created a consensus for change. Now, I did mention, it, and, you know, Peter mentioned it as well, that um, there is a polarization of politics now that we haven't seen perhaps um, before. And this is not just an Australian issue, this is a global issue. You, know, you, you look at the US and it's a classic case. And that makes that more difficult. But I think as business people and as, and as, and as Australians here, we should all be pushing that agenda and really saying, you know, we do need this debate. Thank you. Um, I'm told we've got time for one more question. Thank you. Um, Your name and organisation, please. Um, Fred Affleck from Fremantle Ports. Um, our mining industry, resource industry as a whole, is led generally by large corporate entities with very heavy levels of international investment. Um, an opportunity, as both speakers have said, is in the agricultural area where that corporate model doesn't seem to exist. Have you got any suggestions? I'll, I'll just make the point that I think um, the National Party is an issue in, in this question. And, and uh, traditionally, uh, Australian farms have been family farms. So and then, the, uh, then there's the issue of investment, uh, and I think that Mike made reference to, that, that the industry needs, uh, big investment needs, to sort of move to the next level. So uh, I think it, uh, there's a mindset at the moment that uh, Australian farming is dominated by family farms, well, particularly in the West, but uh, dominated by family farms, and then uh, th there's the issue then of what does that mean if there's major investment required, how do you get that major investment? Uh, can you do it under the present structure or does the structure need to change? And but I, I think the National Party is loath to change the structure at the moment. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. I, th I think the, 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 the issue is here that you can have corporate farming alongside family farming, you know, the, the, the two are not exclusive. And it, it does depend very much on the niche, uh, the product, and, and indeed the, um, what, you're, what you're actually producing. But I, you know, I still think that the, the understanding of, of the amount of capital that is required has not just got home. And I think the fact is that Australia is not willing to invest in agriculture. And again, the super funds, um, you would expect them as superannuation funds, you know, as pension funds, you would expect them to invest in long-term assets like agriculture and infrastructure. But they're not because the way that it's been set up is that you, you look at their performance on a quarterly basis. What is the point of looking at a 30-year asset on a quarterly basis? It's ridiculous. But they all do it, so therefore they are, they are absolutely, um, they're almost corralled into just um, the equity market, because that's where they'll get the return, or the bond market. So, um, you know, I think that we do need to think, uh, and maybe the financial services inquiry um, should have that one on its agenda. I'll try and put it on. <laughs> well, thank you, Mike. And ladies and gentlemen, the second last thing I need to do is, as your chair, is to ask uh, that you thank our speakers by way of round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.